So in continuing our creature composite, in the last video and tutorial, we, we talked about getting inspiration that had a clean silhouette, a silhouette shape that even if it's just a shadow on the wall, we can kind of understand the anatomy that we're looking at. So for instance, if I take this, this Pokemon shape, and then I'm just going to use direct adjustments here and levels to really darken the darks and really lighten the lights. You see that the eyes are the last thing to disappear. Like that's really the focal point of this design. But even though this is just a blob, you get the sense of something that's rigid, pivoting on a, some sort of spinal structure that has connecting shoulders and collarbones enough to push out this hand. And then that gives stability, like all of that weight is supported by this base, which is kind of slug-like, right? Silhouette is incredibly important for us believing that this thing can move and can hold its own weight. And I like to compare it to a piece of pasta, right? So if I show you a piece of macaroni here, and that macaroni is uncooked, it has rigid structure, and we see it as an object. If I show you a piece of cooked macaroni, then it feels like it can't hold itself up. And creatures have to be a mix of both. They have to have those, those aspects to them that are like uncooked macaroni, <laughs> that are rigid, and that's the skeletal structure. That's the thing like the rib cage, the skull, the hips. And then they have to have the things that are like soft macaroni that work in between those rigid structures, like the neck, the waist, the shoulder joints, the things that are dynamic and the things that are static, like the cranium versus the mandible. So once you're kind of in mind of that silhouette, that's what informs your sketch. And then once you have your sketch, you kind of know the connective tissue you need. So I need a head, and then I also need a neck, and I need that to transition into the shoulders, into the chest. I need that to transition into the arms. I need that to transition into this kind of slug-like body underneath. And if I get its proportions wrong, if I make this smaller part or this, this lower part smaller than the things above it, then it's going to look like macaroni that's just folding in on itself, right? It's not going to hold its own weight. So observing character design can really help you observe those different skeletal structures that can make your creature believable, no matter how absurd it might look. So when you have a creature, for instance, with these spindly little legs, these kind of bird legs, this one works well. This one works well, these tiny legs, because the body is very balanced right over the top of those legs. And then anything that's projecting out from the body is very lightweight as well, like the wings and feathers, this really feathery tail. But if I put like an alligator tail on that and I only support it with those spindly little legs, all of a sudden it has no believability. So the sketching can help you with this. The one I don't think is as successful is this guy's spindly little legs <laughs> because that head feels like it's the heaviest thing. And so this creature works better as like a flying creature than one that has to support its own gravity on the ground. So you're thinking through all of this, kind of the stability, what parts are rigid, what parts are flexible. And then that's going to come into kind of the reference you, you find as well. Well, we're going to be building it out of found photo resources, right? Yeah, but it can be out as, as outlandish as you want. But we want it to be able to, to move because we want to have the option to animate it later. So if we only show it from the front, Pokemon generally does a good job with this. But for instance, this design, uh, because it's just a front view only, as a silhouette, it doesn't give us a clear sense of its anatomy. Like its arms kind of get hidden in that big round shape. And when we animate that, like what is there to animate? It's basically trying to animate a marshmallow. 
because it doesn't have that clear structure inside. And then if it's from straight silhouette, so for instance, I think I said this last time, but if it's like this horse, but we only see two legs because it's so directly from the side, like some people like to draw horses, that we don't even get a sense of how wide apart are the, the front legs and the back legs. Then it becomes really hard to animate in any way that feels three-dimensional. Now, even if we don't end up animating our creature, because that will be one of your options, we need to place this creature into your landscape. And your landscape has a foreground, middle ground, and background. It has a, an implied depth to it. So if your creature doesn't have any depth to it, then that's not going to look great in your landscape. Right? We're not going to know how big the shadow needs to be. We're not going to know where the light hits. So that's why these kind of three-quarter views are much more helpful, especially where the silhouette of them shows where the appendages are, where the, the joints would be, and kind of the distance between, especially things like the collarbone and the pelvis. All right. And once you start playing with those kind of basic shapes in creatures, you'll notice that they're all, all creature design uses the same structure. A cranium, some sort of spinal ridge, collarbone, rib cage, pelvis, and then if they have a tail, it's just an extension of that spine. And the only difference between them is how much space there is in those softer spaces, like the neck and the waist, and then the overall widths and proportions. So a gorilla has a much wider collarbone, right? And a snake has a much narrower one. Okay. So continuing on, here's my sketch. It's good to post your sketch. That's something you're going to turn in just like you did for your landscape. And then I just posted our next step, which is collecting lots of high-res reference. I'm using Pixabay kind of exclusively for this so that everything is high quality. And I don't need to worry about watermarks. I don't need to worry about anything being too small. But what I do need to worry about is the angle that I'm looking for. So when I've done my sketch, and this is why we sketch first, my head is at this kind of three-quarter angle looking slightly down. So if I wanted to use like a toad's head for that, this is a good resource to use. This one is not, because even though this one's three-quarter, this one's looking up, and the lighting's pretty harsh on it, it limits it. This one is in bright light, it's looking the right direction, I can see that most of it is in sharp focus. There's a pretty pretty uh, severe kind of macro focus pull here where it loses focus on this back edge. But this part could be very useful to me. And of course, I can flip it horizontally, but I can't like make it be looking up if I only have this pixel information. So then I just download it. I want to be signed in with just some email address. I just use my Google credentials to download it at full size and just make sure you are doing the actual Pixabay images, not the, uh, the ones they might advertise to you, like the stock footage ones. It goes into downloads. And then my next step is to organize it into my assignment folder. And while I am organizing it, I like to label it for the purpose I have in mind. So under my references here, you'll see that I've labeled each file. So where might I use this? I might even open it up quickly in preview and then just use tools to flip it horizontally, though I can do that with transform in uh, Photoshop as well. But that is good for the top of the head. Now I have this already for the top of the head because I wanted something a little more alien and beetle-ish. And then I have something for, what else? For the eyes, for the face. So I'm going to be combining a lot of different textures, and I just want that high-res reference that's in focus and angled the right way, and not lit to, to some really harsh extreme where there's really deep shadows. Okay, 
So once you have those, we're ready to continue. I'm going to take my sketch, and just like we did for the landscape, I'm going to use my guides and kind of frame around my creature's sketch, giving it a little bit of space on each side. And then I'm going to use the crop tool within Photoshop. This is all a, a repeat of what we did for the landscape project. And I'm going to crop it to the size where if I'm just going to print a portfolio piece of just my creature design, this is the, the pixel space I want to use. So I need to make it the right number of pixels. So I go to image, image size. Now I know that my cropped image is this size. I want it to be at least 8 by 10. And for this, I don't need to go to 11 by 14 because my landscape's already 11 by 14. This is going to be going into the landscape. So I'm just going to make it fit on something that's at least 8 by 10. It looks like my height is my limiting factor. So I'm going to put my height up to 8. So it's going to be 8 by 10.3. And then the resolution, I'm going to keep my studio resolution of 350. But remember, the minimum is 8 by 10 by 300. You can always go higher. All right. Now, I need to create a working space. So I'm going to go ahead, because I, I digitally sketched this on a few different layers, I'm going to go ahead and, and collapse these three drawing layers together. So it's all there. And now I'm going to say image canvas size. And I'm going to make this 40 inches wide by 30 inches tall. This is my working space. I'm going to use a gray background, but I think it's just going to be empty space anyway. Oh, no. There we go. Gray background. And there we are. And then that is my uh, kind of inspiration reference there. I can keep it there, or I can maybe put it onto its own layer and maybe tuck it up in the corner somewhere. Now, this is my image size, 30 inches by 40 inches at 350 pixels per inch. That is 14,000 pixels by 10,500 pixels. A lot of pixels, which gives me a lot of space to put these high-res images. So I'm just going to start dumping them on. But where I used the kind of analogy of foreground, middle ground, background, and, and animation background painting for the landscape, here I'm going to use a metaphor of assembling a car, right? Kind of on an assembly line. You have to, to build certain parts together before you bolt the whole thing together, right? And the most important part of a car is to build the engine. So the engine has a lot of really complex parts that have to be arranged and oiled and massaged and refined, machined just so. Then once you have that, that engine ready, then you're able to kind of bolt that into the chassis of the car. And then you can do some of the, the body work and bolt that onto the car, put the wheels on. So we're going to treat the engine as the focal point of our creature, which is going to be the head. That's the thing we're going to build first before we bolt it onto the body. So I'm going to bring all of the head components over here, maybe to the top right. And I can immediately kind of shrink them down a little bit because I don't need them to be too huge. Like that's for the top of the head, parts of it. This is one, one option for the back of the head. I thought it might be fun to bring in some, some of that wild uh, color and feather texture and blend that into this kind of rock slug body. This was the face, though those eyes are creepy as anything. I'm going to replace the eyes, but I liked this for the, the general, it already looks like kind of molten rock for the face. And that's probably a little too big. I can take that down still. Remember, they're still smart objects, so as long as I don't rasterize them until I've sized them, um, I can keep playing with transforming them as much as I want as smart objects. I have another option for the back of the head here. 